bonds and their darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way, in the same way as who? They, in the same way as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who would that be? Angels who did not keep their own domain. Ah, as these, I'm looking at the screen back there. You're looking at the screen. As they, these indulge in gross immorality. See, so they're pursuing flesh that is not appropriate to them because they're not supposed to be involved with mankind. Secondly, they're just bringing in all kinds of perversion, gross immorality. And went after strange flesh. All right, these are exhibited as an example in undergoing punishment of eternal fire. These angels who did not keep their own domain. You say, well, can angels cause that much problem? Look, just give yourself a couple of angels. Let's see what can happen with that. Let's take four. Revelation 9, 13. Six angels sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released so that they would kill a third of the population on the planet. How many billions of people is that? Four angels. Four Fallen angels. They're not good angels because you don't bind good angels. And so this is the kind of power, this is the kind of influence that is being put upon the, uh, this pre-flood world. And the kind of influence. And so in Genesis 6, 5, again, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. You see God really upset about the angels. The angels are toast. The fallen angels are toast. They were in the very presence of God. They knew God by sight. They had every reason to be faithful and obedient. There is no redemption for angels because they're not having to live by faith. They were living by sight. Those fallen angels are done. God is still concerned about the created order that has the opportunity to know Him and to walk with Him by faith, in our case. So he says, the very intent and thoughts of his heart were only evil continued from their youth throughout their age. And the Lord was sorry that He made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. Now we're going to be careful with the word sorry, because we want to remember that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth for our sin. So God is not surprised that this is happening because He's given His Son Jesus before the creation even happens to redeem us from our sin. So what is this saying? God is heartbroken about the effect of sin. So I have to ask myself the question, if what makes God sad is sin, and He, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, He paid the sin debt for me, and now He has made me a child of God, why would I want to continue to walk in sin? I have been called to a life of holiness. But a life of holiness, I cannot live in my flesh. I have to live by the power of God within me, the Spirit of God, within me. And so if I'm going to live that kind of life, not that I'm going to be totally sinless in my lifetime, but if I'm going to live a holy kind of life, I'm going to have to have the Spirit of God who comes into my life when I'm born again, when I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, do that work in me because it is not something that I'm able to do for myself. Well, is this the only place that the Scripture talks about this? Well, if you look at Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is a passage that was written to lost people or Christians. 
Ah, to Christians. You see, what would be more grievous to God than, than that Jesus would die on for our sin, die on our behalf, set us free from the power of sin and death, and we would still choose to live in sin. And so when God wants to move us in a direction to do what it is that He knows is going to be best for our life and cause us to rejoice and to and have joy and, and to know the reality of God's presence at work, and we move away from that. The direction that the enemy wants us to go. We grieve the Holy Spirit. The scripture speaks of this further in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Do not quench the Spirit of God. Now, Jesus, in, in, he's in, in His ministry, and He says on the earth, He says the time is coming when, you know, we're going to, there's going to be fire that's going to be set forth. John the Baptist talks about Jesus and says, there's one who's coming. Is I baptize you in water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this idea that, that God is at work in our lives like a fire. Why would we see? I mean, this is very popular on Christian radio right now, this idea. This idea of passion and, and a fire for God. But a lot of people never talk about why that says that. You see, when you look at the scripture, the reason for the fire is that I, like silver or gold, or like my older brother said, like lead, <laughs> melt it down, you can get dross out of it. You can skim the stuff out of the top that's not what you want and get rid of it. But to do it, you have to heat it up. So the Spirit of God is in the life of the believer and we are being purified, heated up, often by the experiences of our life and the, the things that cause us to have fears and questions and we have to trust God and we're being heated up by those things and we see the stuff that's in us when we become angrier, we become a mocker or we become whatever it is and God is saying, look, up oh, there it is on the surface. Let's get that out. Because only by the power of God can that happen. Do not despise prophetic utterances but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Why did it say not to quench the Spirit? Because if we're not abstaining from every form of evil, if we're not clinging to the things that are good, clinging to the things that are good, then we're going to wind up putting out the fire, the, the zeal, the, um, the thing that causes us to be excited about God is that we're just going to cool off. Cool off toward the things of God. And this is a, a bad place for a believer to be. Now, back in chapter 6, verse 7, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and the birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Is it possible? That you could live in what has been described as the most perverse and corrupt period of history up to the possibility of what it's going to be like during the Great Tribulation. And still be a person who walks with God. I, I talk to students. I talk to young couples. I talk to senior adults. They all say the same thing. It is so hard to live for the Lord in these times. There are so many forces pushing us. We're tired. We're stretched. There are so many temptations and difficulties. And, and, and it's just hard to, to live your faith out. And yet, here is an example. In the worst period of history, and, and Noah did it, but he didn't do it because of himself. He did it because he was the person who knew God, who walked with God, who had examples of that that mentored him and he followed their lead and he was a person who was on mission with God. 
He wasn't just coming up with a mission to do something just to do something. No, he was listening and paying attention to God. And when God found him and said, here's somebody who has a heart for me. And this is the one I'm going to use to bring about this new start. To bring salvation, if you please, to the world, to creation. God did the same. We're going to hear all about that next week, Lord willing. But Noah was available to give that witness. And so you and I can, as children of God, who now, through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, have His Spirit within us, we can learn to walk that way in these times. Notice in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. For you were formerly darkness. That's me. Without Jesus, living in darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. To say walk means to live that way day by day. For the fruit of the light consists in, here's the example then, what am I supposed to live in? All goodness and righteousness and truth. Three things I'm to live in. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. This is something that can happen not because I'm still living in the darkness, but I just choose to do it. I'm going to live in goodness and righteousness and truth. No. It's possible because I'm out of darkness into light. And so now I can invest my life toward an eternity. I can live trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, where do I do that? Where do I learn what's pleasing to the Lord? Anybody got one of these? Yeah. You ought to have at least one. And it ought to be kind of worn out from reading. It would be good. Because that would be an indication that you're trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You're in there seeing what matters to God. You're seeing the things that He encourages and going away from the things that He discourages. And so here's what we're doing. Verse 11, we don't participate in unfruitful deeds. Now you see the contrast. There's the fruit of the light. And then there's the unfruitful things that uh, we need to do away with. The deeds of darkness. Do not participate in them. Everything has fruit. What in the world does that mean? Well, that means that lost people and saved people are all free. No, it doesn't. Same people are supposed to be free, but in a good way. Well, what does that mean? We should be producing a consequence of the fact that we're children of life. That the goodness in our life because of Jesus and the righteousness we have imputed to us because of Him and His completed work on the cross and the truth that we have because Jesus is the truth and because we know His Word, that all of these things should be bearing fruit. People should see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness. It's on and on as you go through those gifts of the fruit of the Spirit. But when I get involved with sin as a believer, when I choose to walk in sin, am I producing that fruit? No, I'm under discipline and correction. According to the book of Hebrews, I'm under discipline because God loves me too much to leave me out there in sin. Why? Because that sin is unfruitful. It doesn't produce anything good. It produces consequences. But from my personal experience, I can tell you they're not any good. They're not any good. So instead of hiding those things, which we have a tendency to do, I'm doing things that I should not do, I'm going to kind of hide those things. No, I need to get them out. And one of the ways to be accountable very often is to find somebody that you can trust and sit down with and expose the things in your own life. This is not really always talking about exposing it to somebody else. You know this, there's this terrible sin. And he's doing it. No. What, what needs to be exposed in my own life? I can sit down with somebody that I can trust and I can call and say, I'm struggling with this temptation again. 
No, we're not going to be a part of those things. We're going to expose them. We're going to get them out. Out of the way. Another thing we see in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, as you look at this, I want to remind you again. None of this is a surprise for God. Everything that's happening now, everything that will happen in the future, everything that has already happened, God is the great I am. And that may not mean a lot to us at first glance. But what that means is, you conjugate I am, and that's God. I am who I am. I am who I was. I am who I will be. I was who I was. I will be who I will be. However you conjugate I am, that's God. So he is able to exist in every period of history and to know everything that's going on because he has that knowledge as God. So then we, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, oh, there's the fruit of darkness. A futile way of life. I want to encourage you today, if you've never surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ, that you would join me in escaping a futile way of life. I escaped it years ago, thank the Lord. And you can escape it too. You can have a life that comes to you that is eternal and was one that will your sin debt will be paid. And you will walk with God not only in this life, but for all eternity. But this one comes from the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. It comes from the blood of Christ. You say, well, how can the blood of somebody who died on a cross over 2,000 years ago take care of me? That sacrifice is what the Father desired. And sent His Son to pay Jesus Willingly came to pay so that every